Hey guys, how's it going? A final video on Baldur's Gate 3 before release. We are just over 12 hours from release. By the time this goes up, probably will be 12 hours, maybe even less. So if you don't see this before then, that would make complete sense. Now they've updated us on a few things just prior to launch, but I just want to quickly run through just in case you're not around it. There are some slightly spoilery things in here. I'll notify you when those are coming up and I'll do that at the end of the video, so don't stress. Thank you to everyone for your support. I really appreciate it. I'm so close to that 500 sub goal. If any of these videos help you out, please hit the button. All right. So just yesterday, they gave us some interesting information, and that is delete your in-game early access saves and uninstall early access. I'd seen some people saying installing early access was going to kind of give you a head start on the download. I mean, I understand that thinking. It makes sense, right? If you have part of the game installed, installing the rest of it's easy. Not quite how it works. Um, they've changed so much in Act 1 that the game is going to have to overwrite so much anyway. Um, best to just do what they say, I would suggest. You know, they're, asked, they're suggesting you uninstall. They're suggesting you delete your saves. Saves don't carry over anyway into the full release, so I'd go ahead and just do this one. If you're a little confused, essentially when a game or any kind of program updates on top of itself, there's always the slight margin for error right? It's completely likely that if you've got this early access installed, then you install the full game, you're going to be completely fine. I wouldn't stress that much if you're watching this after release and you've installed on top of the early access. It probably doesn't matter, but there's going to be a small percentage of people where this does have an impact, and that's who they're trying to save here. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not going to play it in the next 12 hours before release, so I'll uninstall it myself. Now, if you're unsure where to find those things, they do give you a handy rundown here just telling you how to delete your in-game early access saves and how to uninstall the game. I'd expect you guys probably can do this, but hey, if you need a little hand or you're not sure exactly where to find this information, it's all it's all right here. Um, you can pause the screen if you need to, or I'm sure you can find it on the Steam page too. They also suggest deleting any mods. Um, I hadn't really looked for mods for the early access version. I'd be curious, what mods were you guys running? Do you have mods? What, what was there? What have I missed out on? If you do have them, delete it. And of course, the usual stuff, they suggest you install Baldur's Gate 3 on an SSD. It just makes the most sense. The game's going to run better on that. Again, if you don't have one, it'll be fine. Generally, SSDs just give you slightly faster load times and stuff like that. Again, they just say it's good practice. Well, actually, they say it's good practice to have more space on the drive than needed, but it's also good practice to use SSDs. And of course, they ask you to update your graphics card drivers. All right, now onto the community update number 22. This is their last community update before a full release. Obviously, it's coming in like a few hours. Um, this is where some of the spoilers are, but I'll go through some of the non-spoilery things first, and then I'll give you a heads up. So first up, there are Twitch drops. Uh, if that interests you, it looks like these are all camp clothes. So not something you'll wear around the game world that much, but something you can wear in... Well, as far as I'm aware, you can't wear them in the game world, but wear them in camp. Uh, those start on the 3rd and end on the 17th. So plenty of time for you to get these just by watching them. Pretty sure any stream on Twitch, it seems. Um, I haven't seen anything else in relation to this. Look, I am going to be streaming on YouTube and Twitch. Probably not on release because unfortunately I live in Australia and we're getting it at like 11 p.m., 1 a.m. And since there's no preload, which I'll touch on in a minute, uh, I don't know exactly when this is going to be playable for me. But hey, if you want some clothing, deets are all here. Jump into a Twitch stream and just put it on in the background. All right. In the community update, they also gave us another trailer, which you can find on their YouTube page. It's just um, some information on just some of the voice actors. You know, joining is J.K. Simmons, Jason Isaacs. Look, again, interesting information. I haven't gone too deep into this because, again, I just want to experience it when it comes out. Um, I wouldn't say this is much of a spoiler. I mean, they've also mentioned that uh, Amelia Tyler returns and she's the um, she's the narrator for the game. I actually love... Some people don't like the narration I've seen in the comments, but I love the narration. So I'm kind of keen to see how it goes throughout the entire game. All right. And we've I've already touched on this in other videos, but we have um, comments on respecking your party. So it's been confirmed you can respec all the origin characters at any point in time. That was... A question for a while because the origin characters classes are very closely tied to some of their stories especially will and gale and shadow heart so it, it, people were 
trying to determine it does it can you can you do it you can you can so it's all it's all done just note that the class that they started as their initial class that they're intended to be will have an influence over the role play options and dialogue even if you've swapped away from it so <laughs> Lazel, if you're here and you've taken her to be a bard she'll still act more like a fighter in the dialogue options so there there may be a bit of like uncanny valley kind of like oh that's my character's a bard but she's acting like a fighter or in will's case you know he's supposed to be a warlock maybe but you've turned him into god knows what a ranger and he's acting differently there's going to be some of that but hey it gives you the opportunity there to build out your party the way you like and i think in most interactions you're probably not going to notice it lazel's personality is abrasive i suppose and i suppose it doesn't matter whether she's a bard or a fighter she can just be abrasive by the way all right and look we've already, i mentioned in another video as well you guys might might have seen the uh launch day times uh again lucky me down here in australia i get it uh well i'm over here so i'm on the west side so i do technically get it august 3rd at like 11 p.m um but as for that i don't know how long the download's really going to take it is 122 gigs so I'm expecting, which is here. So I'm expecting that, I don't know how long that's going to take. If you don't know, Internet Australia is not, not, not solid. Our, um, our government's shit and did not do a good job with it. So I don't know when I'll be playing it, but I will be streaming this at least well, sometime on the 4th. So hit the subscribe button, tune in and check it out. That was, that was hard. They've also mentioned in here for any of you Mac users that if you have purchased the game through Steam and GOG, they come with both PC and Mac access. I've never played a game on Mac myself. I don't know. I'd, I'd be curious to know what percentage of people play on Mac. But hey, if you're one of those people, you don't have to worry about purchasing two keys. It carries over between. Something I forgot to touch on when I was covering this the first time, so I'm going to cut it in, is that there will be no preloading of the game yikes i think i just kind of commented on this um because obviously i mentioned the download is going to take me a while being in australia um they advised that the preload couldn't happen because there was an early access version so because the early access version is available obviously if you go to hit play you're playing that so you can't preload on top of that seem don't allow that functionality kind of sucks kind of sucks hard but hey i mean we'll just have to download it on release I am crossing my fingers that that doesn't absolutely ruin the servers with a ton of people, across, especially being a global launch with everyone trying to do it at the same time. But we're just going to have to pray, essentially. I mentioned in another video that they chose this launch time because it apparently gives Steam the most opportunity to provide support if things go wrong, as they did at the early access launch. So, yeah, we're just going to have to hope for that one. They've also talked about cross-save compatibility, which is available on launch, and that'll continue through to the PlayStation 5 launch, which is pretty interesting. I mean, I do have a PS5. I was considering buying it on both, um, uh, but instead I'll just play it on PC and I'll couch co-op with friends when the opportunity arises. Uh, but it, it's good that if you do have a PS5 and you're planning to play it on there, if you start on PC, you can turn it over. Something to be mindful of, though, is... It's sold separately. So if you're doing that, you'll have to buy both versions. Kind of rough, but it is what it is. I also mentioned this in a previous video as well. Baldur's Gate will run on Steam Deck. It's not Steam Deck verified as of launch. I don't know really what that means. I assume it just means that it's perfect to run on Steam Deck. Uh, but you can see here they've got a little graphic of it running on the Steam Deck. If you own a Steam Deck, that's kind of cool. It's Steam Deck is something that I've kind of been somewhat curious, not curious in. Uh, but hey, if you have one, being able to play it on there is insane. I love, I love the idea of just being able to like just chill in bed and just play some balls go through. And then finally, just some other notes on system requirements. It will run at 4K. Kind of expected that. And has ultra wide support, which is something I appreciate. I play on an ultra wide because um, I'm just a sick, a sick fuck, I guess. Or a penchant, I have a penchant for the excess, apparently. So hey, just a bit of love for you guys out there with ultra wides like me. Um, hey, can't complain about that. All right, and the final bit before I start getting into some spoilery territory is they're just 
further clarifying how dialogue works in Baldur's Gate 3. There's been a few questions about this and I've answered a few questions in my comments before as well on this one. And look, they give you a full rundown here, but I'll give you the cliff notes and you can always read this as I'm chatting or you can obviously find this on the uh, on the Steam pages or some of their community pages. So essentially, like I've mentioned in some previous videos, the character that enters a dialogue situation is the one that runs that dialogue. So if I walk into a room first and I'm Shadowheart, somebody approaches me, I have to run that dialogue interaction. Now there are some situations where you can back out and then take over with another character, but, and I'd given, I've given this example before, if you walk into a combat encounter, an ambush for example, they address me because I'm piloting Shadowheart or Shadowheart's at the front of the party. I can't get out of that. So if I'm not happy with the fact that, oh, well actually Will back there has great deception because I've done something to him or whatever. Well, that's a shame. I can't, I can't get Will into that encounter. So if you're playing solo, be mindful about who you're piloting because I believe the person you're controlling at that time and who your other party members are following, I believe that person is the one that will generally get sucked into dialogue encounters, unless maybe it's character specific, um, if it has to do with an origin character. Um, otherwise, just try to have whoever's you want doing the chatting leading the party. At the end of the day, it is what it is. I wouldn't stress too much. I'll just scroll down here so you can read. I wouldn't stress too much. Again, it's you have to remember with this game, failure isn't a bad thing. If you walk in somewhere, completely botch some dialogue options, don't do well. You've, you've completely ruined what you were hoping to do. That's not a bad thing. It's just a different path on the story. So I'd say roll with the punches. Just go with it. It's part of the story. It's part of the idea. Um, you can always go through on later playthroughs and save scum, do that kind of stuff. But I would say just, just play it naturally. I think that's going to be the best way to do it. So I've touched on this before. If you're in multiplayer and enter a dialogue and you want your friends to know what's going on, they can come over, click on your character and they'll be able to listen in. They'll be able to see the same screen you do. For example, here, they'd be able to see this exact same stuff. The difference being that when you're making dialogue options, they can't choose those for you. You have to choose which dialogue option there is. So say there's four options. Your teammates can vote on which one they want and you'll see which one they're voting for. So they can do that while listening in and clicking on what they think should be should be chosen. But you don't have to follow that. So up to you if you want to go by a majority rule if you're playing with friends or if you just want to let whoever's running it, running it. Um, me and my friends, we tend to do a bit of both. I guess we generally vote on what we kind of want to see happen. Um, but sometimes somebody goes a bit rogue and who the hell knows where it goes from there. And they also mention in here in multiplayer, you do have the option to set certain dialogues to private so your teammates won't be able to listen in. Not a bad idea. I can't like that, especially if you get deep into the role play of this. Um, that's not something I'd thought of. I don't think it's something me and my friends will do, but I like having the option. And I think that's what this game is all about. And look, like I just said, whether it's based on class, race, or other proficiencies, it's important to remember that there are no truly wrong answers, but plenty of consequences. And that's what you need to run with. In, long so in the long term, the story will be defined by your choices and the consequences of your actions. You will always have choices to make. Trust the dice and it'll always show you a good time. I think that's perfect. I think that's an absolute perfect way to sum that and sum up what I was also trying to say there. And look, if I didn't touch on it, in some cases you can back out of a dialogue encounter. So if you go into a town and talk to a static NPC who's just standing there, you'll likely be able to back out of that, re-enter with somebody else. All right. And then just another note on romance here. So I I, a lot of people had questions and I actually had this question as well about who can romance who in certain situations. And they've broken that down here. So a played origin character can romance an NPC origin character. An NPC origin cannot romance another NPC. So if you're playing solo, you've got Will and, well, let's say Will and Shadowheart here as your NPCs. So they're just in your party, but you're piloting someone else as your main character. They're not going to go ahead and start romancing each other. They're not going to have those interactions in the background. Things you talk about with Will, for example, not Will, with Gale, for example, might impact Shadowheart. We've talked about that before. If Shadowheart overhears you having a suspicious conversation with someone, that could change her dialogue options with you in that camp. But you're not going to see Shadowheart and Gale skip off into the bushes and start doing freaky shit. And finally, played origins cannot romance other player origins. This is one I was curious about. Um, given I plan to play with friends, like, could I romance my friend's character? 
Uh, or could we romance each other, I suppose? Uh, it turns out, no, you can't. And look, I kind of understand that. I guess it makes some sense. So it's more a solo experience. It'd be interesting because I'm going to be playing with two other friends. So we're going to have at least one NPC origin. Can we all romance that single NPC origin at the same time? I guess we might find out. All right, guys, this is where things are going to probably get spoilery. So if you made it this far, I need to duck out. Thank you so much. Again, please do like, subscribe, comment. It all helps me out. I try to see you guys down there and reply to every comment I can. It's been a thrill seeing the channel take some, uh, well, take an uptick in subs. Thank you so much. See if you can help me reach that 500 goal. Let's see if we can do it. All right. And the final update, this is where the spoilery stuff is again. Duck out if you're not wanting that. Is they just kind of touched on a bit more about the mysterious abilities through the Mind Flayer Parasite. Now, if you've played Early Access, you'll know that there's like specific dialogue options and certain things you can do with the with the parasite that impacts certain characters in the world and helps you kind of influence that. Well, it turns out, and I know some of you may have seen some of these screenshots. I'd seen them floating around, but I hadn't seen a good breakdown. There is a complete skill tree associated with the Illithid powers. Now, I don't have a full breakdown of this. I've seen some bits and pieces here and there, which I tried to pull together, but I couldn't quite find enough that I wanted to make a full video on this because, it again, this is going to be something I'm going to probably touch on on release with its own video. Um, as you can see, it kind of comes out and it spreads to different nodes, and each of these different nodes give you a different power. I have seen some videos of people breaking these down. I apologize. I can't remember who they are. I don't know where I left off, to be honest. So I just tried to read this <laughs> on, my, on my monitor. I was just trying to read this, but I don't know where I left off, so I'm just going to run with it. So essentially, the skills you get here, some of them are active, some of them are passive. If you've played Early Access, you'll know that some of the characters um, in Early Access receive some of these skills automatically. Now, I don't think that'll happen on full release. I think you'll have to slot in what you want here, and you get them through consuming parasites. Now, I've seen some of this in some gameplay. Again, if those of you who've played Early Access, you might remember you run into a few characters very early on, not far from the crashed Mind Flayer ship. And when you kill one, a parasite pops out and kind of flitters away. Now, I believe at full release, you can capture that parasite, consume it, and then you get a point and take its power. And obviously that will then happen through the game. Now it's completely up to you if you use these powers, use this skill tree. And I guess to expand on that here, it says some of them are located inside jars and in pools of brine, others within the skulls of the infected. So you must consume them to use them. And each parasite unlocks one a new elithid power within a skill tree of 25 powerful mind player and spider abilities. So this is a good breakdown here. It says they're divided into five branches themed around manipulation, health, restoration, psionics and abilities that can inflict immense damage and torment enemies to gradually weaken them over time. Some abilities can be used to control those around you, pushing them to say things in dialogue they would not otherwise. Others endow you with the power to push and pull enemies like ragdolls during battle. I'm curious if you can use some of these on party members to kind of turn them down an evil path now that I've read that, but I guess we'll have to remain to be seen. And you can become a displacer beast through this skill tree. Now, here's the interesting thing, right? The deeper you go through the Iliathid skill tree, I've just realized this is just lighting up my face over and over. The deeper you go through the Iliathid skill tree, the more powers you'll discover, but nothing comes without a cost. And this is something we're not sure about, which is really interesting. While your companions can also consume parasites to gain their powers, not everyone in your party will agree with it. And your companion's perception of you can undergo a significant shift based on how you approach this opportunity. I think it's pretty obvious some characters aren't going to like this. I think you probably guess who. I'm going to move that so it stops lighting up my face. Um, obviously, they say it can get a bit more complicated, but they don't want to spoil it. And I think that's perfect. That's all. The, this is all the information I want. It's obviously not a deep spoiler, but it's something that can kind of give you an idea. Now, this ability here, you can see, is free cast. I don't know if you guys can read that. I had to, like pause and like really zoom in on this essentially this gives you a free cast of a spell um and it's resets on a short or long rest so if you're a wizard this is pretty good it gives you additional spell slots each day essentially because you can get them after a short or two short rests and then obviously after your long rest as well now this will become available so you can pretty much get three uses out of this during a day um it look i don't i don't actually want to know what the rest of these are so i haven't looked too much into them i can't wait to use this this seems like 
great fun and just an extra level. I'm so curious to know what the impacts of using this are and the, the push and pull between the temptation of using these skills, but whatever the consequences are going to be. And I love that I don't know what the consequences are. All right, look, this is where I'm going to finish this one off. This pr I pretty much captured everything that's within this community update and their just recent announcement saying delete your saves. Again, guys, delete your saves, to uninstall the game or the early access version rather. But if you haven't done it and you're watching this after the fact, which is very likely, don't stress. It's completely fine. You'll be you'll be right. If you are having hiccups with the game, just do a fresh install if you're one of those people who have done the install on top of the early access. But again, I doubt it'll be a problem. I think they're just being extra safe for that small minority of people who might have the occasional issue. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I again appreciate it. I haven't done one of these like talking head videos with my face in it before, so it was a bit odd, but I thank you for sticking it out. Again, I'll be streaming this on release. I don't know exact time frames. It'll probably be for anyone in Australia or anyone who wants to do the conversion yourselves, probably be around like 8 a.m. or 10 a.m. Sydney time, I would say, because I'm going to have to download it overnight. So I'm then just, I'm going to put it on, get some sleep, get up bright and early, jump straight in. So catch me then and I'll see you guys in the next one.